they're a blessing and asset to our church. It's fun to watch them grow. I remember when they first sang, and J.D. first started playing, and uh, they just both all progressing, and uh, God's using them uh, very well, and I appreciate his goodness. Anybody got a word on your heart before we look at the 14th chapter of Romans? Anybody got something you just... And Paul is leaning toward the question, what does a person look like who has presented his or her body as a living sacrifice to the Lord? Uh, so uh, he began that little journey in chapter 12, and now we're in chapter 14. I've titled this, Finding a Balance. Uh, and we could also title this as, Learn to, Learning to Live with One Another Despite Our Differences. Um, every one of us in this church are different. All churches are different. Uh, and uh, if, as long as you have differences, you'll have disagreements and you'll have things that are interesting, to say the least. And Paul writes in this text, and let me give you just a backdrop of just a moment of why, why we're, he's writing what he's writing. And uh, sadly, a lot of church splits have taken place through the years. Uh, over choices in entertainment, uh, choices in music, choices in preachers, pastors, uh, choices in music, uh, choices in proper attire, uh, social drinking, tobacco use. And we could go on and on and on. You wouldn't believe. And sad to say, even sometimes the color of the carpet or whether you're going to have chandeliers or single light bulbs. And uh, the... Whether your hair is too short or whether it's too long. Whether you need to wear frame glasses or wear rim glasses. And we could go on and on with different stories that I've heard through the years. Uh, and we've got the great controversy all around us with different things. But the bottom line of what Paul's trying to say is here uh, that there's a difference in a preference and a conviction. A preference is maybe something we lean toward, but a conviction is based off of scriptures. And there's gray areas. Paul addressed the Corinthian chapter 8 uh, on those gray areas. And there's gray areas in the arena of about everything you deal with. So when Christians differ, we have to allow our preferences uh, not to be wedges in our fellowship. Uh, instead of focusing on our, on our boundaries, we need to focus on our likenesses, the things that we have in common. Now what's going on here in the backdrop of this scripture is this. The Jews have been saved out of strict... Uh, legalist, uh, a strict legalistic background uh, that we would be very difficult to forget. The sacrifices, the keeping of special days, and all those things around the calendar of the Jewish calendar under the law. Then the Gentiles are saved, and the Gentiles never had to worry about diets. They had never had to worry about special days or any of those things. And now you've got the Jew and you've got the Gentile in the same church. They've come to Christ. They've come to Jesus Christ in relationship. Now, some in Rome thought that it was wrong uh, for them to do certain things, uh, so they were uh, to eat certain foods, so there were, there were very strict vegetarians. Now, today, there are those today that uh, are, are choose a vegan diet, but that has nothing to do. Most of the time, that's due to cholesterol or keeping your uh, bloodline clean and a good health, whatever it may be. It has nothing to do with the Scripture, okay? So there's nothing wrong with that. If a person wants to do that, uh, that's fine. But they had made this a religious criteria, and we need to understand that. They begin to criticize one another, and they begin, begin to profile one another. And sometimes they even got to the point they would disassociate themselves from one another because of these different beliefs and these different ideologies that they've been raised in. But here's the bottom line. Paul said love, God's love, will see to it that those who are weaker in the faith uh, than we are will, be not, will not be caused to stumble because of our behavior. That's what he's dealing with. So, actually, he's saying the weaker brother is actually the one who abstains from certain things. Uh, he's the one who abstains from meat, and on and on you go, and different things, okay? The one who keeps those, uh, he, he judges by appearances, uh, and he fails to distinguish between outward and inward attitudes. And, and, and instead, he focuses on boundaries and puts up boundaries. And that's what Paul's writing about here. First of all, notice what he says. If we're going to find a balance, we're to accept one another genuinely, genuinely. 
We're to accept one another genuinely. That's what he says in the first four verses. He says, Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputa disputations. For one believeth that we may eat all things, and another who's weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holding up, for God is able to make him stand. So he says we're to accept one another genuinely, first of all. That's what he's saying. He says that we're not to be uh, have doubtful disputations. In other words, uh, it's, we're not to battle and debate over what's right and what's wrong. And, 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 and by the way, let me say when we get into this, there are some things that we have to be convicted about. Uh, it, he's not saying anything goes, okay? So let's understand that up front. He, yes, there are some things we need to be convicted about. There's some fundamentals you cannot change on the Word of God, but there are some gray areas. There's some things that we can let go. There's some things we can look over, uh, but there's some things we've got to be very careful of because it can be a stumbling block to others. In every church, those who are weak and they're those who are strong. It's what he's saying in this first, first verse. Uh, the first four verses are actually. And he says the weak must not condemn the strong and call them unspiritual. And he says the strong must not despise the weak and call them immature. We need to receive one another. Okay? That's the whole idea of what he's saying. Uh, he says, so whatever you eat, he says, for one believes he can eat all things. And another says, uh, who is weak, just eats herbs and fruits and vegetables. Uh, he's not a meat eater, but let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. In other words, they got to the place here as you read this text. Uh, he, what's he saying here? Uh, verse 3 is very clear. He says, we must never despise our brother because of what they eat or who they are, or uh, whether, if, in their differences, okay? And folks, we've got people today that you ever heard them say, well, I just despise him, or I just despise her. That We, we need to move out of our, out of our vocabulary. <laughs> uh, I just despise that they, uh, that they eat onions before they come to church. Uh, well, if they like onions and they want to eat onions, just so they don't breathe on me, praise God, amen? There's some things that, but you see where I'm going? We've got to be very careful uh, that we don't, we, that we receive one another. That's what he's saying. We're to accept one another genuinely. He says, who art thou that judgest another man's servant? We need to remember that I'm God's servant, you're God's servant, and he's the judge. He'll do the judging. Amen? He says, to his own master, he standeth or falleth. When he stands before, when you stand before your master, the Lord Jesus, listen, I'm not your boss. I'm your spiritual leader. I'm your teacher, preacher, pastor. But listen, when, when the Holy Spirit is your guide, uh, God the Father, listen, and the Word of God is authority in your life. And there's some things that I don't do that you may do. Uh, and there's some things that you don't do that I may do. But whatever the case is, listen, there's some things we all have to sort out. Look what he says. Yea, uh, he says in verse 3, And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. Let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. In other words, it's not about what we eat. It's not whether we eat pork or we don't eat pork. It's not whether we're, we're, we're a vegetarian or we're a, we're a meat eater. And they'd made this a great big debate. And they begin to isolate each other because of this. Isn't it amazing what we get off on sometimes and we separate over? That's what he's dealing with here, folks. And we, If we're never going to impact this world... If we can't accept one another genuinely, that's what he's saying. Well, secondly, we're to accept one another graciously. Uh, look, uh, we, 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 he, he says, first of all, let me go back to verse 3 again. Let, really two ideas here as we accept one another genuinely. First of all, we must never despise our brother. And secondly, we must never disgrace our brother. In other words, we shouldn't embarrass them or make a scene over whether they eat meat or they don't eat meat, okay? Uh, and so on and so forth. Well, secondly, he says, or thirdly, we must never divert our brother, verse 4. We never, he, we never shouldn't divert our brother. In other words, we shouldn't uh, steer him away from us or not have anything to do with him uh, because he doesn't do exact things exactly the way we do them. Now, we got people today. We've got people today. Listen, I call across America, and we've come to this thing, 
Listen, I love the King James Bible, okay? I, I mean, I believe it's authoritative. And everything I can study and all the records I can get, everything I can go back and study, I believe it is the authoritative and it is close to the original manuscripts we have. But listen, I, I got, there's some great uh, theologians, there's some great preachers today that use other translations to the pulpit. Who am I to condemn them and say that they're, they're going to hell because they use another translation or they're ungodly or they're wicked or immoral or they're just not, worth, they're just not godly or they're carnal? Listen, that's foolishness. He's called men to, he's called us to rightly divide the word of truth. And I want every resource I can get, everything I can get to break this book down and to make it simple and make it understandable so that every person can hear it and respond to it. And if you read it in another translation and you get it and you grow in your relationship with God, so be it. Amen. And these birds running around here saying, well, 1611, 1611, all, that's all you hear. They couldn't even read a 1611 if they had it. In the original manuscripts. And if you've ever tried to read one, you can't even read it. Uh, it, it it's so, it, there's so many these and thous and all the, the tenses of the word. Folks, listen, we need to read what we can. And we take, God has put stuff to, uh, out there to make it available. And we've got churches today that won't fellowship with one another. We've got preachers who won't fellowship with one another. They're, they're in division and they're at each other's all the time. Listen, because they don't carry the right kind of Bible. I was doing a funeral not long ago with one of our church folk. Had a guy walk in. Renee was there. And he walked up to the guy that was helping me. He said, preach now the King James today. If you're not, I'm going to the house. I thought, boy, you're a real blessing, aren't you? Come walk in the funeral. The guy's getting ready to preach a funeral. And he, and, and he says to, to the other pastor there, and I thought, I just drew up. I said, man, I just want to let him have it. You got a family hurting. We'll get to that in just a moment because he deals with that too. Well, we're, we're, to accept, secondly, we're to accept one another graciously. Paul says, really, in these first four verses, if God receives him, who are, who are we to do any different? Who are we to do any different? We're to accept one another graciously. First of all, he says we must never disgrace our brother in verse 5. He says, one man esteemeth one day above another, and another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. What's he talking about here? Well, the Jews had, uh, they kept the Sabbath. They had feast days. They had special days, days to do this, days to not do that. And, and Paul says, listen, some of these came out of that, the rigor of that. And they're growing and they're developing. And who are we to try to all of a sudden to straighten them out? They have to grow and they have to develop. And they need to move out of that. And they need to understand that they have freedom in Christ. And that's what he was battling with. He said, one man esteemeth one day above another and another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. <laughs> He's saying that we're never to disgrace our brother. In verse 6, we must never demotivate our brother. He says, He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth thanks. They both give thanks. They give thanks for the food, and that's the main thing. Give thanks to the food, whether it's meat or whether it's vegetables, no matter what it is. But they've made a big deal out of this thing. Paul says as long as it's been blessed, eat it and enjoy it. But don't be offensive toward one another. And if one worships on one day and another worships on another day, he said, listen, don't, don't crawl each other about it. At least they're worshiping. Now, I don't... I, I, don't, I believe that the, the day of worship changed after the resurrection. I believe the Sabbath was changed to the first day of the week. Uh, and I believe that. I believe that's the truth of the Scriptures. But my real problem with the seven-day Adventists is not that. The real problem with the seven-day Adventists is that is they, they don't believe in a rapture of the church. They believe we're going straight into the tribulation. And that's the doctrinal sense problem I have. And some other Old Testament uh, books, passages in Revelation that they take out of context. Well, he says that we are to accept one another graciously. Why? Because it doesn't matter whether we come out from the law or whether, whether we're Jew or whether we're Gentile, we've been saved by grace. And it's not about meat. It's not about vegetables. It's about Jesus. Look what he says in verse 6. He says we must never demotivate our brother. He says he that regardeth the day, I've already read it. He says, 
for he giveth to God thanks, and he that eateth not unto the Lord, he eateth not and giveth thanks. So he's coming to two conclusions right here from this portion of Scripture, first of all. First of all, in the first six verses, he's showing us this truth. Uniformity. Uniformity is not imperative. God didn't call every one of us to be just alike. Okay? I love steak. And you may hate steak. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we're at odds at one another. Okay? You can just give me your steak if we go out to eat. Amen? All right? Praise the Lord. I'll buy you a baked tater. All right? We ain't going to get mad over it. Amen? That's what he's saying. They were making a big deal out of this thing. And he says, listen, your, your, your common ground is in Jesus. <laughs> it, it, it's in grace through faith. It, it's not about all the do's and the don'ts. And we've got enough of those. Listen, uniformity is not imperative. God didn't call everybody to be the same. God didn't call this church to be like Prospect. Or he didn't call us to be like the church, Norwood First Baptist or South Stanley. Uh, he, he didn't call us to be like any of those churches. He's called this church to be unique. Now, there's some fundamentals we have to believe on if we're going to have fellowship with them. There's some things that we have to line up on, and you can't sway from that. But the, uh, they may do things different down there or over there than we do here. But you see, God has a uniqueness about us that we're to love one another and work together for the common good to win this community of Jesus Christ. They may only eat vegetables down there, and they need to get saved. We're going to eat meat up here, amen? We're on the meat. They're still on the milk. All right? I'm just picking. All right? Uniformity is not imperative. Listen, God didn't call everybody to be like you, and he didn't call everybody to be like me. Secondly, unity is not impossible. That's what he's saying. Look at verse 7 four, through verse 9. It's not impossible. He says that, for none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth unto himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. <laughs> For to this end Christ both died and arose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Well, what a, what a statement. What's he trying to show us? Listen, he, he says that we're, it's amazing to me that he mentions the Lord here eight times. Eight different times in the script he uses the, the, the L-O-R-D, Lord. What's he trying to say? Here's what he's trying to say. No Christian has the right to play God in another Christian's life. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Dr. Warren Wiersbe said, I quote, We can pray, advise, and admonish, but we cannot play God. God is our boss. You, you notice something? Notice what he says here. He says in verse 8, For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. You know what I've noticed through the years? And I think about what Paul's writing here about the unity uh, not, is not impossible. Have you noticed that uh, differences of opinion sort of Fade into insignificance when there's a death. Think about it for just a moment. Differences of opinion, even differences of religion, differences in views of Scripture, differences, differences about what the Bible says all fade into insignificance when death knocks on our door. Pretty interesting. You see, we're not too much worried about that person's opinion any longer. We're worried about their soul. When death comes knocking on our door, we're not, we're, we're not battling and debating over our differences of opinion, what this scripture says and what that scripture says. We're focusing on ministering to that family who's in need and, and hurting. We're ministering during that time. We drop those barriers in those walls and we, we remove those barriers of difference. And we take food. Are you with me? We take drinks. We send flowers. We send cards. Well, why can't, we, why can't it be like that when we're living? Huh? That's what Paul's saying. Paul says, listen, with the bottom line, when it's all said and done, whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. Bottom line is, it's our goal to please Him. To please Him and Him only. <laughs> 
Well, thirdly, we're not only to accept one another genuinely, we're to accept one another graciously. He says, thirdly, we're to accept one another not grudgingly. Look at verse 10. He said, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Sometimes we forget that, don't we? Look at verse 12. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Let us not, not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. What is he saying here? Well, he's showing us a dynamic truth here. We're, not, we're to accept one another not grudgingly. Not grudgingly. Do you know that the desire to criticize falls on every one of us? It lies dormant in every one of our hearts and lives. Every one of us. Why? Because we have a, we have a, a fleshly nature, even though we've been saved. And, we, and it's so easy for us to criticize because when we criticize, it takes the, the guilt sometimes off of us. It takes the load off of us. You know, but gossip and criticism never accomplish anything, do they? Never. You see, what he's saying here in this text is, is criticize, criticism is purposeless. It has no purpose. It's purposeless. And secondly, criticism is presumptuous. Matthew 7, verse 1 through verse 5. You remember that text? Uh, Jesus wrote, uh, spoke there, Matthew 7. You remember what he said in that text? I'm going to read it for you tonight. He, uh, he warned us there in that text. and This gives us a little reminder. He said, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And what, and what measure you meet or you measure, it shall be measured to you again. And why holdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in your own eye? In other words, he's talking about a splinter and a beam, the variation, the difference. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam's in your own eye? He said, you hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of your own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye powerful powerful scripture so what's he saying here he's saying criticism is purposeless criticism is presumption jesus in that text in gospels matthew and paul also in this same text is saying this too often if we're not careful we judge the behavior of others while looking over our own behavior we better make sure we've cleaned out from underneath our own front porch before we judge their front porch. Amen? That's what he's saying. We're to accept one another not grudgingly. Well, look at the fourth point. We're to uh, accommodate one another wisely. Now, this section goes from verse 14 all the way to chapter 5, really, to verse 7. But I'm going to camp out there for just a moment in those preceding verses as we look to... Uh, verse 12 and just remind look at verse 11 once again he reminds us in verse 10 that we're going to all stand before the judgment seat of christ why because isaiah said in the old testament he says as i live saith the lord every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to god we know that paul also said the same thing he says so then every one of us shall give an account of himself to god let us not therefore judge one another, Jesus, as Jesus said in Matthew 7, okay? But judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Now, what's interesting here is what he's saying, all right? He's talking about putting something in, intentionally in front of somebody else to cause them to stumble. And we got to make sure that we don't do that. Well, uh, Suppose, suppose that you actually lived in the first century, uh, and you were had a dinner guest at your house, and uh, you know that somebody would be offended if you served meat at your house. What would you do? And by the way, you've got meat. It's fresh meat. It's from the market, and it's been offered as a sacrifice. Do you stand and brag and say, man, we're going, to have, we're going to have roasted lamb tonight, fresh off the grill, fresh off the sacrifice grill today? No, 
out of respect, you know what you'd do? You'd say that we have other foods available. You knew they were coming, and you made provision. That's the attitude Paul's talking about here. You see, what he's dealing with is this, that self-denial is the cornerstone of personal freedom. Self-denial is the, is the cornerstone of self, personal freedom. We've experienced a little bit with, uh, with uh, my, uh, James's diet. James has found out recently that he has to, has to have a gluten-free diet. And man, I had my heart set on pizza the other night. We were going down to, and they got a, a place down there in Wadesboro that uh, Papa's Joe's or something. Oh man, alive! Oh, you know, brother. And 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 they give you, you get two medium pizzas of thin crust. It's out of this world. If you haven't tried it, probably the best place in Wadesboro. And uh, well, I wanted pizza so bad. And uh, but anyhow, all of a sudden they called back and said we can't go there. We're going to have to go to Mexico. <sighs> And I'm thinking carbs, carbs, carbs. Doctor, doctor, doctor on Tuesday, well, whatever day it was. But anyhow, uh, so but bless his little heart, he, there are certain things he can't have. And we've had to adjust. Our whole family has. When we have gathered, we have to make sure because he wants those things. And, and he can't have those things because it'll, it'll make him bad, bad, very, very, very sick. And they finally discover what it is, and he, he has to stay away from that stuff. Do you know how rude it would be for us to get a, a hand-tossed, stuffed crust cheese pizza around the edge and say, James, come on in here. We're going to have pizza. You can't have any. You watch us eat. We're going to give you crackers or, or whatever it is that's gluten-free. He can't even eat crackers. Bless his heart. We're going to give you sliced cheese. Sort of the same context of what's happening here. They begin to make a big deal out of these things. But, and and pa what Paul's trying to say is this. Is Self-denial is the cornerstone of personal freedom. There's just some things we don't do. And some things we would even because a, a person is immature, more immature than we are. And maybe a growing Christian, we've got to watch ourselves. Even though we may be free to do some things, they don't know and they haven't learned. And we've got to set up safeguards. And we've got to be very careful so that we ca don't cause them, here it is, to, to stumble. We can't be a stumbling block. You know, the quickest way for a child to get hurt is to tell him just to do whatever he wants. Go ahead and ride that skateboard on that rail. Don't come to me crying. Guess what? You know he doesn't need to be riding down that rail on that skateboard. You ever watched any of those videos? Dear Lord. Some of those guys go down those walls and those rails and they hit on their head and they hit, I mean, they hit parts that you don't want to hit. I mean, it's terrible. Roll around and flop and have cuts all over them and they get back up and do it again. But you know, usually the child's immaturity will cause him to hurt himself or to hurt somebody else if you don't tell him that there's dangers out there. You see, the, uh, here, what, he's, what I'm getting is this. A truly free person is one who's willing to listen, obey, and use his freedom to help someone else at his own expense. And you see, some of these that were saved and had never followed these strict diets and these special days had become at odds with these who had lived in these types of, this type of atmosphere. And they begin to think that they were more superior and they begin and, and begin to cause a division. That's what Paul's dealing with. Paul says, you have to go stop. Remember, there needs to be some self-denial in you. These folks are growing and they're developing. He says, you have to realize you're going to be, not to become a stumbling block to them. You're going to be a stumbling block to those outside that are watching to see how you get along with one another. Well, let me come to a conclusion because there are seven principles in this next section we're going to deal with on Wednesday night. Okay. There's two extremes to the Christian life, basically, that we have to consider and look at tonight, okay, from, from the portion of Scripture we've looked at so far. First of all, there are those who are what we call legalists. A legalist has to regulate everyone's life around them. Uh, they've never allowed some of the guidelines that they have apply themselves but they've got guidelines for everybody else 
You see, there's guidelines that they hold over other people, but there's guidelines that they should be holding that they're not holding, okay? Those were legalists. And there's some things that he gets into, and he really gets into in chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians. But there's those who are legalists. And can I, and, and I came from an area that's much like that, just to be honest with you, a lot of things. Um, women didn't wear pants in the church I was raised in. Um, you'd never see a man with a pair of shorts on in the church I was raised in. Um, and you still want many of them, and there's some of them around here like that as well. But do we measure a person's spiritual status and relationship with the Lord by what they wear? I've seen some of the meanest people there are wearing a three-piece suit or a dress that's down to her ankles and her hair up in a bun. Amen. We've got to be very careful how we evaluate and examine people. Then there's those who are not only legalist, but there are those who are liberal. <laughs> they think grace gives them a license to do or say or live or act or dress or function any way they want to because of grace. Folks, both of those lines of thinking are dangerous. We've got to find a middle ground. But I will say this, and we'll get to that next part. You always need to ask yourself, am I, am I what I'm doing and how I'm presenting myself, is it presentable to Jesus? Young ladies have always asked me, they've asked, and our daughter herself, should I wear this? I always say, look in the mirror. Does it represent Jesus? If it doesn't represent Jesus, there's your answer. <laughs> Amen. It's the best way to evaluate it. If it doesn't represent Jesus, if it doesn't uplift Him in some way, leave it out, discard it. But these were in a place where they, they weren't doing that. They were causing these things to be a dividing line. They were causing them to be a division. And Paul says, listen, if you're going to ever impact the culture you live in and those around you, you have to find some common ground. You have to find some likenesses. You have to accept one another. Let God do the sorting out. Let God take the word and convict and let him do the work. Listen, if you don't wear what I say you shouldn't wear, you, you know what? You're obeying me. Are you with me? You're obeying me. You're not obeying the Lord. If you do what pleases me, you're worshiping me. But if you're listening to God and you're listening to Scripture, you're obeying Him. And that's your responsibility is to obey this Word, not the preacher. That's who you give an account to. That's who you're going to stand before in the way that we conduct ourselves in the church, out of the church, in our family, in our home, in the business, everywhere. We, the ultimate judge, he says, is Him. You don't have to please me with what you wear, but you have to please and honor him. And that's what Paul wants them to understand. Instead of bickering back and forth and separating and dividing over one another, Paul says, listen, there's no room for that. He says, listen, we need, to we need to realize whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. And whether we live, therefore, or die, we, listen, we're the preachers. No. We are the Lord's. Bottom line, that settles it. If you're a Christian, you belong to Jesus. You're accountable to Jesus. You're to live according to His Word. But you shouldn't be a stumbling block to others who haven't come to the truth of maturity in the Scriptures. And you've got to be very careful. Okay? And that's what Paul's getting at. And he's leaning into this next point, the next division that we're going to see as we move on. And go through chapter 15, okay? So, actually, uh, as you look to verse 14 and following, notice what he says again. Once again, let us not therefore judge one another anymore. But, you know, if we'd spend more time judging ourselves, we would, we'd have less time to judge everybody else. 
wouldn't we? If we'd spend more time judging ourselves, reading our Bible, praying, and being an effective witness for Jesus Christ, and being the disciple He wants us to be, we won't have time to nitpick on what people's got on, what people's wearing, or what, what their hair looks like, or, or on and on you go, would we? I went to a meeting not long ago, and I saw a guy. And this is, this, I saw a guy doing this. He looked around the tables where pastors were. And he was trying to look at the sides of their Bible to see what kind of version it said on it. He did, I promise. I said, Lord, help him. Help him. And before we left, sure enough, sure enough, in that meeting, well, I'll tell you what I believe. I just believe in the King James Bible. And I said, oh, here we go. Here we go. I didn't want to get off on that wagon. I said, guys, I got to go. So, anyhow, this ruined everything. It had. The meeting we had already had. And I thought, there's no room for that. Let us therefore judge one another. Listen, listen what he says. Let us there not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. We should ask ourselves, Lord, is this going to cause somebody to stumble? Let me give you a hypothetical illustration here. Suppose... You went to Buffalo Wild Wings. Isn't that what that's called? East Coast Wings, sorry, I'm wrong, wrong place. And you see me there at lunchtime, and I got me a big old thing of wings. And I got me a, I mean, I, I'm having a time, and I got me a big old mug of beer. And you know that I've been preaching on abstinence ever since I've been here. And I'm sitting there chugging that baby and having the time of my life. I'll guarantee you, if you got any conviction about you at all, you wouldn't be in this church on Sunday morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. You see, we've got to be careful in everything we do. Not to live in a shell, that's not what he's talking about. But we've got to make sure that we don't set somebody else up for a fall who may be an immature believer. We may, maybe need to make sure that we live what we preach and teach. We must make sure that we live what we believe around others. It does no good if we say we love sinners and we don't love them. It does no good if we say we're a welcoming, loving church and we don't speak to them when they come in. It does no good if we see somebody that comes to the house of God and we're trying to influence them if they see us living a life that's totally contrary to what we say. We stand and testify how we love God and how we love Jesus. And, and then we say, man, I despise them. <laughs> you know what we've done? We've just become a stumbling block. That's what Paul's saying. Well, again, Paul's not saying anything goes. He's not saying that. But he's telling us just to be careful that we just don't go any way. Amen? I ask Danny to come and play tonight. We'll look at the second part of this Wednesday night. Folks, remember, notice that Lord, the title of our Lord was used some eight times that reminding us that not one Christian has the right to play God in another Christian's life. We got to pray, we got to live the word and let God do the, do the convicting, amen. amen. Let's stand. Maybe you're here tonight and maybe God spoke in your heart. Maybe you're not a Christian, you'd be saved. As our heads are bowed and eyes closed, it be a good night for you to do that. You need to find that balance. You're tipping the scales. You never committed your life to Christ. Why wouldn't you get on the other side and balance out your life and be all for Jesus? Secondly, there are those of us around us tonight. Awful easy, awful easy to become nitpicky and judgmental toward others when we got things in our own life we have to work on maybe God's just spoke to our heart tonight rung our bell so to speak maybe there's just somebody that just irks you <laughs> you just come and say Lord help me love them in the eyes of Jesus would you just listen to the Holy Spirit tonight Lord help me not to be a stumbling block with my attitude with my actions with my life Father, thank you for your word. Speak to our hearts. Help us and encourage us tonight. Lord, to search our hearts. Lord, may we 
make every effort tonight, Lord, not to be a stumbling block to others who may be immature Christians. God, help us to not only hear this message, but respond. May we be the examples and patterns we need to be. And if there's anything that causes us otherwise, Lord, I pray that we would let the Holy Spirit sort those things out and repent of them that we might leave here being that living sacrifice that we need to be before a lost and dying world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.